This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead. And that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. Did he get that when there had never been a resurrection in recorded human history? Melchizedek taught him the secret of the bread and the wine. But we have, we have turned tithing, we have turned giving, we have turned all this stuff into so many other things. Why do I give not only to fund what God is doing, but for God to fix this up here? Why? Because the windows of heaven are going to open up and I'm going to receive the revelation that I need of the thing that's holding me back. The Bible says that God, I mean, no, Israel didn't have a storehouse when Malachi wrote that didn't exist. What does the Bible say? The Bible says when we tithe, Jesus received the tithes. It goes, the high priest takes it. I think a lot of these things we need to rethink and rethink our motivations. I don't give to get. I give because I got. That's what the Apostle Paul taught. Don't, don't give out of necessity like, oh, this is going to fix everything. He says give because God's blessed you and God has put on your heart to give. But we've turned it into a major machinery of, of the modern church, taking everything out of context. When I do the word and I am, my soul comes in line with my spirit and my flesh is doing the word, this is what the Apostle John says, so whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Our biggest hindrance to prayer is not the devil, it's us. It's us. Yeah, look at, you know, we've, I mean, God's opening up some new doors and we're getting ready to do some things. And some of this, uh, I've given up on 30 odd, odd years ago, you know, and, and I, I have a prophetic word that we're just now starting to fulfill that was spoken over me when Mary and I first got married, right after we first got married. And so uh, God reminded me of that this week and and, uh, you know, because I'm sitting there, because what's going through my head is, why couldn't you have done this 15, 20 years ago when I was a whole lot younger, you know? And uh, I've actually asked that of God before. And he said, because you were so stubborn and you wouldn't move along to become the man that I could fulfill it through. And that's the truth of all of us. When God gives you a prophetic word, it's our duty not to cause the prophetic word to come to pass on our carnal physical abilities. It's to become the man or woman who can walk in that promise that was given. And the more that we do that, that's what the ribbon are doing right now. Man, they're, they're throwing out anything that even smells of Babylon. Throwing it out, trying to realign to the Word of God and trying to discern truth so they can walk in the kingdom. He goes on to say, and this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave his commandment. Now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him and him and he in him. And by this we know he abides in us by the spirit that he's given us. 
In this, what he's sharing, the commandments are a part of the dynamic of walking with Jesus. And this abiding in, in Hebrew is mikra. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Those that entwine themselves with the Lord, they get all tangled up. In fact, a derivative of that is manifested in mikvah, to be baptized. I am lost in him now as I come up. We, we see it even on the zitzi, on, on the prayer shawl. A true zitzi has a blue thread, Messiah, that the only way to walk in the commandments is to be intertwined with Messiah. And in inter, that intertwining, the name of God is written upon you. That's what John's talking about here. The remnant are going to do the work to intertwine themselves so much with Jesus that it's hard to figure out where they start and he stops. <laughs> so here he reveals several things to us. Answered prayers directly in keeping the commandments of God. The only way into the kingdom is by keeping the commandments. How? Well, Mike... Salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. Absolutely. And that's talking about salvation through circumcision. Acts chapter 15, we had an entire council meeting on that in church history. But you do have to keep one commandment to get saved. The command to believe on the Lord Jesus. If you don't do that commandment, you will never, ever, ever be saved. So even salvation is a command. We, and then the second commandment, once you get in, you got to love God's kids. Sometimes that is an act of faith. Because just like you, they're a work in progress. And all of us come into the kingdom carrying trunk loads of baggage. At the Holy Spirit the whole time saying, why don't you go ahead and put that thing down, put this thing down, put, you know, I got a little backpack I want you to take. Quit trying to drag along those 16 trunks. You may have made them fancy and you actually got wheels on them, but go ahead and cast them off because my burden is light and my yoke is easy. And the more, how do we get free in Jesus? You got to get rid of the baggage. Crucify it, lay it down, move it on. Abiding in Christ and keeping the commandments are intertwined. I want to go to Jeremiah chapter 31. The reason I like to go to Jeremiah 31 is in Hebrew when God talks about this new thing that he's going to do. And really new is not really the proper word for Hadashah. But we get Brit Hadashah, the new covenant. Dr. Uh, Walter Kaiser, eminent evangelical theologian that had a, uh, has a Jewish background. In dealing with that word, and we have to drill down in the lexicons to get this, it's improperly interpreted as new. It is, it is to resemble to expand or to renew the covenant. And whenever a king would take new territory... Within biblical times, he would take the covenant that he would have with the land and he would expand it to include the new people. Who are the new people? That's Gentiles. And so the covenant was expanded through the cross to include us, which had been prophesied in the Torah, in the prophets. It was all there. Before Moses, it was prophesied when Israel crossed his hands when he blessed Ephraim and Manasseh. And Ephraim, he literally called the fullness of the Gentiles. It's all there. We were supposed to get in from the beginning. It just took the cross to get us there. But look what it says here in verse 33. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. Now, wait a minute. He's making it with the house of Israel. Well, the Apostle Paul says, you were without God, without hope, book of Ephesians. 
and you were, no, you were not a part of the commonwealth, but those of you who were afar off are now made nigh in Christ. We're now a citizen. Okay? And there's a lot of what is called Israel today that isn't because they rejected Moses, they rejected Jesus, they were broken off. The only way back into the kingdom is faith in Messiah. So there's an Israel in the flesh and there's an Israel in the spirit. I like the spirit one. I pray, for, I pray for Israel in the flesh that they would return to Moses. When they return to Moses, they're going to discover who Jesus is. And that day is coming, the apostle Paul prophesied it. In one day, in one day, they're on this trajectory where they're going to see the end of where they have been going. And when they see that it lies and ruin and damnation in one day, they'll run to Jesus as a nation, as a whole. I'm looking forward to that. And in the body of Christ, our blinders are being lifted from Moses. Oh, I don't want, eh, we'll, we'll deal with that another day. I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, and I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, the interesting thing about Hebraic prophecies is there are compound prophecies. You, have to, you can't think like a Greek and a Roman to understand Hebraic writings. You've got to understand them like a Hebrew. They use block logic, and many times a prophet will literally have two or three prophetic compounded, in, sometimes even in one sentence, there was a time when Isaiah brought his son before the king and was prophesying of the coming of Jesus at the same time he was prophesying about his own son because the first part of it was about this kid, the next one was about God's kid, and then the messianic age all in one breath. And so we have not only a taste of it now when I got saved the Holy Spirit wrote the commandments of God in my heart but in the messianic age we can't turn to a neighbor and say know the Lord because everybody knows him he's physically ruling and reigning in Jerusalem he got the world's attention when he set two feet down on the Mount of Olives and it went like this You want to talk about the ultimate terminator before he left he said I'll be back he is coming back and he is coming back to rule and reign I tell you what when you look at Messiah ben David he's here to kick devil rear end and to chew bubble gum and he's all out of bubble gum he has one initiative those tares that would not bow they're going to burn Mm. I'm looking for that. He says, I will forgive their iniquity and their sins I will remember no more. Why? They're in the rearview mirror. How many know when you get your new body and new earth, the even concept or even thought of sinning won't even run through your mind? You'll be absolutely free from sin, death, and the influence of Lucifer. Man. And if that wasn't good enough, then we get the new heaven and new earth. We get a place that Lucifer has never even been in. No devil, no, no Nephilim, no, no bad watcher, no fallen angel. No sin has ever existed in that place. And its physics are mind-boggling. You won't have to have a light on in your refrigerator. There'll be light in there already. Oh man, God needs you to go do something, you're there. We see kind of reflections of that with Philip and all of a sudden he's one place, then he's another to, to lead this eunuch to Jesus and then somewhere else. That's a whole lot better than Greyhound or Amway or Amway. Amtrak, Amway, oh. TWA, well I'm starting to show my age, American Airlines. Oh, 
I've got to love this. Now, I'm going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, when the Apostle Paul penned this, while we have some today saying that the church was unhinged from the Old Testament, that, of course, is theologically, historically, and so many other levels, a big, sty- big piling steam of dung, okay? Because all they had was the Old Testament. The New Testament was not codified for another 300 plus years. So longer than America has been in existence, there was no New Testament. And the Apostle Paul reminding Timothy of this. Now listen to what, what, now Timothy was half Jewish. That's one of the reasons why Paul allowed Timothy to be circumcised where he wouldn't Titus since Titus was was a Gentile. But he allowed Timothy to be circumcised as, as a young man. And it was also him and Timothy that did the Nazarite vow to prove that they hadn't departed from Moses when the Pharisees accused him of, of, of teaching the Gentiles, now that you're coming to the kingdom, you don't need to do Moses. Paul rebukes them for that and then to put the, the pin on the entire situation, him and Timothy do a Nazarite vow, which is a very lengthy and expensive process just to prove the point. So he's telling Timothy, listen, you must continue in the things that you had learned and been assured of knowing uh, from whom you have learned them. And from, uh, from childhood, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So, Timothy... You've been taught the Scriptures. You have been taught Genesis through Malachi your entire life. And in them you find the wisdom to embrace Messiah. Now, he goes on to say, now put that back in context, he's talking about the Tanakh, the Torah, the writings, and the prophets. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is prof- and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the Apostle Paul's mind, when he penned this, I don't think there is a single New Testament writer that even had a comprehension that one day their writings would be gathered together and canonized as a part of Scripture. They were just dealing with issues. Could you imagine some of the, you know, if, you, if you're the problem solver in your family, and so you're writing solutions to all the crazy things your kinfolk get into, and then one day they would try to codify them and put them together, the wisdom of the so-and-so family? No, he, he learned doing this. Paul learned this at the feet of Gamaliel while he was serving underneath him on the Sanhedrin. In his mind, the Tanakh, the knowledge of who Jesus was, and the power and influence of the Holy Spirit was more than enough to equip any man for what they're supposed to do in Christ. But yet today we have divorced ourselves from the Old Testament and only embraced the New. By doing that, you take your Webster's Dictionary, you throw it out, and you can make the New Testament say anything you want, and nobody is equipped for anything. Are you disregarding the New Testament? No! Don't unhinge it. It's one book written by one God. He just had a lot of secretaries. And there is a continuity of divine inspiration that goes from Genesis to Revelation. And when you can see it all, you understand the kingdom. Now, I want to read this out of the Amplified Bible because I thought it did just an outstanding job here. Every scripture is God-breathed, given by His inspiration, profitable for instruction, for reproof, and conviction of sin. Well, people don't like that one, do they? For, uh, for correction of errors and discipline and obedience and the training in righteousness and holy living and conforming to God's will and thought, purpose, and action. Man, that'll preach. So that 
the man of God may be complete and proficient, well fitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Everything that God calls him to do, he's now loaded for bear. Let me tell you something, right now we're not even loaded for rabbit. It takes a whole book to make a whole Christian. Guys, by abandoning the Old Testament, the body of Christ has become spiritually anemic, shackled by iniquity through ignorance, and have, de and have never developed functional faith. That's why they run from one meeting to another, hoping that a guy has the magic whammy to make all their problems go away. I just, I just, right now, I just basically have said the charismatic movement, what it has degraded into in a nutshell. I remember years ago that uh, we went to a conference and it was supposed to be a move of God. And did you know that the lost couldn't have gotten in because the Christians would have beat them up and pushed them out of the way to get in there thinking they're going to get a little dab of something? You're already supposed to have your little dab. <laughs> And it comes by abiding in Him. The more I know Jesus, the more I know peace. The more I know Jesus, the more I know freedom. The more I know Jesus, the more I know authority. Come on now. You know, when Jesus said, Behold, all authority has been given unto me, now you go. If you look at this word authority... It's exousia, which Jesus in Luke, chapter, in Luke uh, chapter 10 says, Behold, I give you exousia over the dunamis of the enemy. Now, those of you who know a little bit of Greek, I give you authority over the miracle working power of the enemy. That same word dunamis is the, talks about when, when you will be endued with power from the Holy, when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That's dunamis. The early church moved in kingdom dunamis, the devil has anti-kingdom dunamis. Authority is essential. How many know with these lights here today, behind that light switch, there can be a nuclear power plant somewhere just pr producing uh, just unbelievable amounts of power. But you know all it takes is a breaker or a switch to shut it off. That breaker or switch is authority. But when you look at all the definitions that exousia has, and I mean there's a lot of good ones. I could, I could, just, I could preach from the lexicon right now and it would be an entire series just dealing with authority. But the number one, the number one, the number one is being given the power of to choose. When the Holy Ghost came on you and began convicting you of sin, He was not only convicting you of sin, but He was giving you an anointing that empowered you to choose Jesus, no matter what the devil would try to do. And once I have Jesus, I am no longer a slave to sin. I am have been given authority by him to choose righteousness. I got one more scripture and I've got three minutes. Romans chapter 6. Do you know you're still a slave, even in Christ? According to the Apostle Paul. Do you not know that to whom, starting in verse 16, do you know not to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are the one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But, thank, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which ye have been delivered and have been set free from sin, you became a slave of righteousness." Do you know when you're really moving in the kingdom? When you just can't help but do the right thing. You're addicted to holiness. You're addicted to doing what Jesus would do. That's Christian maturity. 
John Wesley and those had a doctrine they called entire sanctification, and they thought you could get to a place where you couldn't sin because they were seeing this phenomenon. You got so far in God and had so much work involved in getting the sin out and the righteousness in that when the devil presented a temptation before you, you thought, you know what? I've worked too hard to get where I am in Jesus. I'm not nibbling on that worm. I know where that leads. I'm not biting. Because I'm a slave, I am a servant to the kingdom and to righteousness and the ways of God. This homie don't do that stuff anymore. He got set free from that. Now it used to be that was all I wanted to do. But then I met a man named Jesus who I found out was Almighty God come in the flesh, and he set me free so I could be like him. And now I'm doing what Jesus would do because when I accepted him, he moved on the inside of me. And the life that I now live, I live by the Son of God living right here. I tell you what, when you get there, you got some faith that'll function. You have a heart that won't convict you. But it'll say, go ahead, tell that mountain to move. If it refuses to move, I know where dynamite is. But if Almighty God says that thing's going to move, it's going to move one way or another. Because you knew the Father said, that mountain needs to move. And that's truly the beginning of functional faith. He has known your name. You've departed from evil. And now you're starting to function in the kingdom the way that God has called you to. And I can't wait to get into the rest of this in our next session. Father, we just ask today that you would cause these words to go deep in our heart, in our hearts, that we look for the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit to make us more like Jesus and to move in his behalf and his earth. Let us be his arms, his legs, his feet, his hands, and let us be his voice in a world filled with darkness, we ask in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store dot biblical dash life dot com that store dot biblical dash life dot com